Good afternoon. Welcome again. Thank you for joining us. My name is Mike Mitchell. I serve as Assistant Director of Alumni Relations here at Salem State, and I'm a proud graduate of the class of 2007. I'll be your moderator for this afternoon's talk. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for the first event of Alumni Weekend 2021, State of the U, featuring Salem State President John Keenan, Vice President of Diversity and Inclusion, Dr. Sean Bennett, Vice President of Institutional Advancement and Executive Director of the Salem State Foundation, Cheryl Krauss, and last but certainly not least, our Provost and Academic Vice President, Dr. David Silva. Before we begin, I'd like to just briefly cover our agenda and some housekeeping items for today's talk. Each of our presenters will take a little bit of time in the first half of the program to cover relevant updates from their respective areas within the university. Following that, we'll proceed to an open format Q&A session. Questions received in advance will be given priority, but we certainly invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A feature here on Zoom, and we'll get to as many as we can, time permitting. Those that we cannot get to, we will provide those questions to the individuals that they are addressed to and do our best to get you an answer after the program is over. Thank you all for joining us again, and it's now my pleasure to introduce the 14th president of Salem State University, John Keenan. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for the first official event of Alumni Weekend 2021. Last year at this time, we were in the early stages of COVID-19 pandemic and facing much uncertainty as we wrapped up the academic year. But we're not quite out of the woods yet. I'm thrilled to share that we weathered this storm well on our campus. And I am further encouraged by the current public health trends and excited to return to a nearly normal campus environment in the fall. A few weeks ago, we welcomed almost 1,500 Vikings to the Alumni Association. We celebrated the class of 2021 with both a virtual commencement ceremony and a series of small in-person Viking roll call events. We also welcomed back the members of the class of 2020, so that they too could be recognized and celebrated. The Viking roll call events allowed us to maintain the most cherished part of our commencement ceremony, when our students crossed the stage to the applause of their friends and family. While it wasn't our traditional ceremony, our commencement team creatively replicated the pomp and circumstance that typically marks the end of an academic journey with some personal touches that made it a joyous occasion for all. The best part, as always, was seeing the excitement and emotion of our newest alumni and their loved ones. Many of them thanked us for making the celebration so memorable. The end of the academic year is always a time of reflection. While this year was by no means typical, our students, faculty, and staff gave 100%. They have made me prouder than ever to be a Viking. Our exceptional faculty, staff, and administrators made it a priority to keep our students' academic progress on track while also keeping our campus as safe as possible. Together, we pivoted to online and hybrid learning, offered both virtual and in-person student services, and through the COVID-19 tested contact tracing and symptom monitoring technology, we consistently kept positivity rates lower than the local area and state averages. The pandemic has been a defining moment for everyone. Our students, faculty, and staff, and administrators have shown the kind of resilience that we've become expected from our Viking community. We also had several successes last year that should not be overshadowed by the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll hear more about some of these shortly, but a few highlights include a historic gift from Kim Gassichilla and her husband, Philip, for completion grants, the official launch of Salem State University's Frederick E. Berry Institute of Politics and Civic Engagement, a nonpartisan institute dedicated to promoting the political and civic participation of all, and the exciting news of the Bertalone School of Business. As we look toward the future, we do so with an eye toward positioning ourselves to be more student-centered and student-ready than ever before. Next year, we are set to update our strategic plan. Our current plan, which went from 2017 to 2021, was extended a year. Now the next plan will take us through 2027. While we consider what we accomplished and the work that remains, to be completed from the last plan. We will also take a hard look at the studies and recommendations from the reports compiled this past year. These will serve as our foundation as we move ahead successfully. We'll use information from documents, including our recent NECHI accreditation review in April, the Sustainable Path Forward Task Force report, and the vision for a sustainable future. We will stay firm in our commitment to students, 
but must also be flexible and adapt to the students of today. As we plan, we must consider the changing landscape of higher education in this country and what it means to be a comprehensive public university in the North Shore region of Massachusetts. Higher education is at a crossroads. At Salem State, we are using this as an opportunity to look at every aspect of our campus and ask ourselves if it aligns with the needs of our students now and into the future. We must consider our student services, resources and academic offerings to make sure that they are aligned with the student needs and demands. We will look at creating the Viking Success Collaborative led by Dr. Sean Bennett, which will function as a network of student resources that includes academic affairs, admissions, advising, enrollment management, inclusive excellence, and student life. Collaborative will be designed to streamline the student experience and remove barriers that have historically stood in the way of student success. These efforts will offer and seek to close the opportunity gaps on our campus, which will work in tandem with our efforts in preparing to become a Hispanic serving institution. As you're likely aware, this federal designation refers to institutions where at least 25% of undergraduates identify as Hispanic. Salem State currently serves a 20% Latinx student population and regional demographic trends suggest will likely reach 25% by 2025. We must define the pathway to better serve these students in the future. Efforts that we believe will benefit our entire student body. Putting students first also means investing in academic areas with high student demand and growth potential. Taking cues from our students and aligning resources with student interest is part of what it means to be a student-centered university. As the region's only comprehensive public university, be assured that we will always offer liberal arts programs and liberal arts courses will always be an invaluable part of our general education curriculum as we seek to educate the whole student. When we look toward the future, we must also consider the physical campus and how our facilities can support the outstanding academic programs we offer here at Salem State. If you have not heard me speak about Project Bold, a campus unification and modernization project, let me tell you now that this major capital project will indeed transform our campus. Through SSU Bold, we seek to establish a compact and efficient campus core while maximizing programmatic synergies and streamlining operations across our campuses. It is designed to enhance the campus experience for all of our students and position us well to serve the North Shore region and prepare its future workforce. SSU Bold includes several things. The sale of South Campus, which we hope to get underway later this summer. The renovation of the Horace Mann Building to help accommodate our South Campus programming, including new nursing and occupational therapy labs, sim labs. The construction of a Meyer Hall addition, which will house the much needed new wet labs for our life sciences and the repurposing of underutilized space in the Frederick E. Berry Library and Learning Commons for instruction. Our application to the state for BOLD was delayed due to the pandemic. However, we expect to hear a resolution on this in the very near future. We are optimistic we will hear a positive response and we are excited to begin the work to see the transformation of our campus take shape. I hope this gives you a sense of the forward-looking approach our campus is taking to ensure that Salem State University continues to serve our region well for generations to come. My job as president is to ensure our students are able to achieve the brighter future they envision when they arrive on our campus and to position us for strength long after my tenure. Higher education is indeed changing, but it remains the best investment toward increased economic opportunity and personal fulfillment. We must seize the moment and ensure we are providing the best opportunities possible for our students now and into the future. I'm optimistic about the future and I'm glad to answer any questions that you may have. But first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sean Bennett, Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion, who will provide an update on our efforts to improve and advance diversity and inclusion on our campus. Dr. Bennett. Thank you, uh, President Keenan. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of the Office of Inclusive Excellence, I'm happy to greet you and share some of the work that we've been engaged in over the last year and the impacts we hope to have over the coming year. The Office of Inclusive Excellence is comprised of myself, a Director of Education, and our Faculty Fellow for Diversity. Together, we serve as catalysts 
for improving the sense of welcome and belonging experienced by faculty, staff, and students at Salem State. Our work takes place all over this campus and community. In the city of Salem, we serve as liaisons to the No Place for Hate Committee and the city of Salem's Racial Equity and Justice Task Force. As you are all too aware, COVID-19 highlights challenges and inequities that are experienced by members of our community. Over the last academic year, we worked with employee resource groups and the National Coalition Building Institute to provide support, education, training to further healing that is required to address systemic injustice, bias, and racism. In collaboration with Student Life and the University Police, we initiated a series of conversations with student groups like Black, Brown, and Proud and the Higher Education and Student Affairs Executive Committee to address student demands that impact access and success. Additionally, we've worked closely with faculty and staff in conjunction with human resources to improve the diversity of our recruitment pools and identify opportunities to retain talented members of our community. I have always personally believed that the alumni experience begins the moment students set foot on campus freshman year. The more that students see us listening to their concerns and celebrating their growth, the stronger that bond becomes. I'm very excited by the work that Inclusive Excellence has been doing in conjunction with alumni relations to engage our BIPOC or Alana, African, Latinx, and Native American and Asian alumni. I'm in fact excited about all of these endeavors and look forward to our continued growth in these spaces. The road ahead is tough, but we will rise to the occasion. At this time, I'd like to transition to Vice President Cheryl Krauss in institutional advancement to share more with you this afternoon. Thank you, Vice President Bennett. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm very happy to provide an update on the great work of the institutional advancement team. But I first wanna start with you, our alumni, and our gratitude for you and the alumni community that helped us with record levels of philanthropic support, likely tracking to surpass 10 million for the first time ever in our history. This extraordinary accomplishment um, includes um, the philanthropy that President Keenan noted from Kim Gassett Schiller and Phil Schiller. Their transformative and State University record-breaking 6 million will be primarily directed to fund our biking completion grants. These grants directed to low-income students from underserved populations um, for students in their final 30 credits. Um, these are students who have exhausted all financial challenges um, and are left with a balance of 500 to 3,000. I'm grateful to Kim, a graduate of the class of 83, and her husband for the work that they've made possible uh, in creating these grants. Um, we've got work to do to close the gap, but this certainly gets us started. We'll be able to fund 50 to 75 students in perpetuity as a result of their groundbreaking philanthropy. I also want to thank uh, another SSU alum, Jean Walsh, class of 71, and her husband, Rick Walsh, for the creation of a scholarship um, that will continue to support and build on the legacy that they've provided to the university over the last 10 years. Um, their $500,000 gift is a testament to their ongoing commitment to advance student success. I also want to thank our partners at Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation who partnered with Salem State um, to provide a pilot program for our educator colors, uh, scholars of color. Over the next two years, this initiative invites early childhood and elementary majors of color into cohorts led by our faculty who advise and help them build community amongst them and helping them along their college journey. Um, the, this program will also create a more equitable teacher pipeline across the Commonwealth, including gateway cities such as Salem, Lynn, 
Chelsea and Revere, where many of you graduates uh, are employed as teachers as well. Um, we're also very proud our fourth annual Viking Warrior Day held on May 4th and 5th, encompassing 1,854 minutes of fundraising and pride building uh, the results are a true testament, I think, to the Viking spirit and strength um, in raising nearly 400,000, um, doubling what we had um, raised the prior year. Um, so we thank you, our alumni, for really stepping up to help us uh, and showing your Viking pride. Uh, we could not have done that without you. Um, the incredible matching gifts that we received, totaling 125,000 as well as um, the transformational support from Joan Philly made in honor of her husband, the late Tom Philly, class of 68. Um, I will say um, Tom uh, is uh, an extraordinary graduate and has been um, quite frankly, a, a great friend to the university over many years. And um, the president Keenan and myself got to know him um, and he pushed us always to do better, to be better um, and I think he's an example of the Viking uh, success stories out there. Um, but he, you know, this wonderful effort is being taken in his honor to raise philanthropic support. The committee that is convened to do this work has set an ambitious goal for themselves to raise a million, of which um, they're already at a, over $800,000 raised to date. Uh, this is just a few months into the fundraising effort. So, you know, Tom leaves us um, with such a strong um, legacy, um, and he set such a wonderful example in his own contributions that he gave to the university. He had enormous trust in the university and gave um, primarily all of his philanthropy unrestricted um, to allow the leadership with the flexibility to use those dollars for the greater good of our students. Um, I also want to say, you know, we 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 were living in a pandemic, and uh, our team tried to provide programming uh, in a very remote and engaging way. Uh, we tested things such as uh, rolling out our first ever It Takes a Viking podcast. Um, uh, you probably heard Mike Mitchell talking uh, with a lot of our Vikings about why, um, why they care about Sound State, why they are still involved, and how Sound State was instrumental in their success. I hope if you haven't checked them out, you will check them out. Um, we also had, for the first time ever, um, celebrated our 40 under 40, our alumni who um, have achieved a, a great and amazing things in our community and have the talent. We hope this will become an annual tradition uh, where we recognize you all, Vikings, and the work that you're doing in our community. We also had the honor to um, lift up uh, alumni-owned businesses through our Viking Lifting Viking program. I think we felt like in this pandemic, that was one way we could help our, our graduates. Um, and I hope you took advantage of the wonderful um, businesses that our alumni owned within the community. Um, and if you, if you wanna know those, you can certainly reach out to Mike and he can put you in touch. Um, but I just wanna thank you know, our alumni community, your, your resilience, your willingness to continue to stay with us despite our ability to be in person um, has been extraordinary and, and we certainly um, have missed seeing you in person and we look forward to, uh, I think, a return to more in-person programming and, and relationship building with you uh, in the year ahead as things start to open up. And I know from a fundraising perspective, uh, we will continue to work with you all to enhance student aid, um, to integrate innovative student centered programming to our academic offerings and provide students not only with the skills and knowledge to succeed in their careers, but also support they need um, to excel in classroom. The pandemic has underscored the on ongoing need for resources that can be directed to emerging challenges and opportunities. Support for unrestricted giving will continue to provide us with that flexibility. And last, certainly not the least, um, our Project Bold initiative will continue to look for resources to support and reimagine Salem State's physical spaces, unifying our campus, creating leading edge science facilities required for today's students, and fostering a stronger, more cohesive campus community. I think with that, I have the wonderful pleasure of turning the microphone over to my colleague, um, David Silva, who is the provost and vice president of academic affairs. David. 
Uh, thank you, Cheryl, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to spend a little bit of time um, giving you um, a bit of a recap of what this past academic year was like. To say that it was unprecedented uh, is an understatement, but um, flexible, innovative, gracious, and patient. Uh, those were the watchwords in academic affairs during this past year. Um, we were required to uh, adapt and adapt we did. Uh, we took what we learned in the spring of 2020 when we had that very sudden pivot in March. Um, and we used those experiences, both the positive ones and the more challenging ones to inform how we would move into academic year 2021. Um, the delivery, the default delivery format for classes uh, for this academic year just ended was some version of online. We developed some practical workshops for faculty who were looking to build their skills and confidence teaching online. Um, because as you may know, it is so much more than simply delivering lectures through Zoom. Uh, the pacing of a course, including its assignments, as well as uh, methods of engaging students in this kind of context, all of these require attention and adaptation. But our faculty, our amazing faculty came through. Um, all the same, for courses uh, where the pedagogy demanded an in-person experience, what we call the embodied learning experience, think uh, tactile clinical skills or, or dance, we did deliver those in person as we could with an abundance of attention to safeguarding the health and well-being of students and faculty members alike. You know, we had um, we adhered to distancing guidelines and masking guidelines, hygiene protocols, etc. Again, flexible, innovative, gracious, and patient really was how we needed to move forward, and we did. Um, but despite all of that, we continued to press forward with some very important initiatives. Um, and so one of those has to do with accreditations. We have a number of programs on our campus that are externally accredited. And accreditations are important because they are externally driven, visible signifiers of quality of a program. Um, the new accreditation as of last year uh, was for the Bertillon School of Business. And uh, we are accredited by AACSB International, which is the premier accrediting body for business schools. Uh, this puts us in the top 5% of business schools, business programs worldwide. Let me repeat that. Top 5% of business programs across the globe. Big congratulations to the Vertilon faculty, the staff, everybody who contributed to that effort, um, much of which was dependent on the support uh, both financial and um, um, otherwise of some very uh, engaged alums. Uh, we also got reaccreditation for our, our School of Social Work and also just recently um, our art department. Uh, we also had some great work in our School of Nursing and our School of Education around uh, regulatory review and compliance for the Commonwealth. And so um, our School of Nursing continues to um, knock it out of the park with their uh, pass rates for their NCLEX exam, which is required for anybody aspiring to be an RN. And our School of Education just underwent a review by the Department of Education, Secondary Education, uh, Elementary and Secondary Education here in the Commonwealth. Um, and then there's the Big Kahuna, which is our regional accreditor, used to be known as NEASC, now known as NECHI. Uh, for us to remain eligible for federal funds and the like, we need to make sure that we have our NECHI accreditation in place. Um, a great self-study was written over the course of the last summer into the fall, into the spring. Uh, we had a site visit in April. It was a virtual site visit that was uh, new for all of us. And we have had some initial feedback, which is really terrific. Um, for the fall of 2021, things are gonna be a little bit different. So when it comes to the delivery format of classes, our need to adapt because of COVID-19 restrictions has brought about some lasting changes. So indeed, what we are seeing is a wider variety of delivery formats. So yes, traditional in-person teaching will be the majority format come this fall. But the proportion of courses that 
are going to be delivered via online or some kind of hybrid format looks to be um, around 30%, which is norm, uh, greater than normal. You know, today's students have expectations about how they engage with others, uh, including professors. And these expectations really demand a 21st century, century digitally grounded choices. So we're trying to optimize choices for our students. Um, also, we are piloting a, an additional form of delivery called HyFlex. And this is where we have a professor and some of the students in one teaching space and simultaneously have students remotely, but they can see each other in real time. They can interact with each other in real time. And again, uh, so many of our students, as you well know, have very uh, full lives. And this provides them some additional opportunity to have access and to be successful in those endeavors. So um, I'm looking forward to the year ahead and um, am happy to advance our mission of educational excellence, excellence in every way possible. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it back over to the president. Thank you, Provost Silva. I think now is the opportunity, Mike, right? We're gonna open it up for some Q&A, which we always, is perhaps my favorite part of these forums is hearing what you wanna learn most about. So uh, Mike, do you have people lined up for questions? Yes, sir. So we've got some questions in advance here. So the first question I'll, I'll put out there is to you, President Keenan. Um, can you talk about any changes um, kind of in the senior leadership level here at the university, um, either going into the next year or uh, changes that occurred in the past academic year? Yeah, so no significant changes as uh, Vice President Bennett is now, I think, approaching or just passed his one year anniversary. Is that right, Dr. Bennett? Right. Um, so that was the one change uh, last That's year. Right. And then I'm also happy to report uh, in the next month or so, uh, Interim President Nate Bryant at North Shore Community College will be returning to our campus. Uh, we've missed him dearly, but he did a wonderful job all over at North Shore. Uh, we look, towards, look forward to his uh, continued leadership on our campus. Uh, and will be Vice President for Student Success, working along with Provost Silver and Vice President Bennett uh, with the Viking Success Collaborative to make sure that we're, we're able to really increase our efforts on being student-centered and focus on retention. So um, looking forward to that. Other than, other than that, our team will stay in place. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed truly with a, a wonderful senior leadership team, uh, including those with me today, Vice President Bennett, uh, Vice President Cheryl Krauts and Provost Silva. Um, we've had a solid team for a long time. Uh, it wasn't a surprise to me that we were able to withstand the COVID pandemic as we were able to because of our leadership. And I'm, I'm extremely proud of that. So look forward to beginning the new year and welcoming our students, faculty and staff uh, back to campus. Thank you, President Keenan. Uh, the next question is for Vice President Bennett. If you would be willing to talk about some areas where you see the most growth and, and opportunity in the coming year for the areas of inclusive excellence. Uh, thank you. I, I think that's a phenomenal question. And I think the answer is everywhere. Um, if we're quite honest, um, when, when I share that um, inclusive excellence is a catalyst for change, it really suggests that we connect with every operation on campus as we think about what needs to happen related to diversity and inclusion across our campus. So there are opportunities for student support and mentorship. Um, the um, the work and the investments and the donations that contributed to an environment where um, students are getting the financial support that we need, that, that, that is part of our diversity conversation, right? On a campus that has 40% of its incoming class self-identify as um, diverse by some category. Um, there are opportunities for us to continue to grow with regard to our recruitment efforts for faculty, our support, efforts for faculty and generally um, creating a sense of belonging and success on campus. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't allude to the Viking Success Collaborative and the importance um, that plays in our future as well. Um, we've done a phenomenal job with access for our diverse community. Now the Viking Success Collaborative gives us a chance to emphasize success um, of those um, individuals as they arrive on campus.
Mike, we can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, you know, we've been doing this for a year and we still forget we're on mute from time to time. It tells us we're, we're normal people that mute, right? <laughs> um, so the next question is for Provost Silva. I know this time of year is always particularly exciting for our faculty that may be looking at the tenure and promotion process. I wonder if you can talk about any new announcements for tenure or promotion of faculty. Wow, what a timely question. <laughs> I'm pleased to report that last night at the full board of trustees meeting, um, a, the full slate of candidates for tenure, for tenure with promotion to associate professor, for promotion to full professor, um, uh, tenure with promotion to assistant librarian, as well as uh, the conferral of emeritus status went uh, swimmingly well. Uh, we have a really great class of candidates for all of these representing the full range of the Salem State academic spectrum. And the work that they've been doing uh, both in the classroom, well, in the classroom, with their scholarship and increasingly in the community and connecting their community work to what students are learning in the classroom and then turning that into valuable scholarship for educators across the country. It's been uh, amazing, absolutely amazing. And it doesn't surprise me at all when I hear alumni say that the thing that they, one of the things that they remember most or best about being at Salem State was relationships they had with the faculty or one or two faculty members in particular. So uh, things are still going strong. And uh, really, I, I, I want to congratulate all of those faculty members who made these very important achievements. Nobody gave them a promotion. Each of them earned it. And for that, they should be proud. Provost Silva, could you uh, talk a little bit about some of the searches we're going to do next year as well, by chance? I could indeed. Um, so we have we have recently put a pause on searches for new tenure track faculty as we navigate the ta the challenging times around us but as we see um, relief on the horizon uh, we've made the decision to invest uh, in tenure track searches in a number of disciplines that represent areas of high student demand and workforce need so bringing those things into alignment so we will be having uh, searches for faculty in departments such as uh, healthcare studies, which for some of you is new, um, but it's our youngest department, um, as well as nursing, which is uh, continues to grow, uh, and uh, psychology, particularly to deliver uh, graduate programs in psychology. And then we also have some hires in education for specialty fields. Um, I'd also want to add a, a hire in the English department for a new director of our uh, writing center, our Mary G. Walsh Writing Center, and bringing in a person who has real experience, not only in supporting writing for native speakers of English, but can really address some of the challenges specific to those of our students for whom English is not their first language, um, because being able to uh, write effectively in English is critical to their success as well. So thank you for that um, prompt, President Keenan. I appreciate it. We're excited about it. There is a, oh, Mike, you're muted again. I did it again. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll get it figured out. Um, you mentioned earlier all the success in the past year of the um, fundraising team with an institutional advancement. Can you talk about um, any new objectives, priorities, or anything that are being considered for uh, fiscal year 22? Um, yes, we, um, I think I alluded to those at the end of my remarks, but we'll continue to focus on um, supporting um, the initiatives actually really discussed in this group, the Viking Success Collaborative, um, faculty um, development through the deans, um, department funds, um, as well as our diversity efforts. And that mani those manifest in a lot of different ways. Um, certainly scholarship, mentoring, coaching, um, things like our Emerging Scholars Program. Um, those are the types of programs that we'll continue to look to partner with uh, our alumni um, and our departments on campus to bring even greater resources to support this great vision of the leadership team with you here today. Thank you. Uh, the next question, probably a bit of a combination for President Keenan and Provost Silva. Um, with the news of the move away from Cat Cove, um, what are the plans to replace the learning opportunities that were available through that facility? 
Yeah, thank you, Mike. That is uh, something that actually has been under review for a long time. I uh, arrived on campus as Vice President for Administration in August of 2014. Um, I think it was my very first trip to Meyer Hall in, uh, to go to a meeting to talk about Cat Cove uh, and its potential for the future and uh, um, other suggestions that might go on down there. So we've been looking at this for a long time. Uh, in fact, in, in the second year of my presidency, I also put together a task force uh, as we began to see other opportunities, such as the muscle demonstration project that a couple of our faculty members have led off of the coast of Gloucester. Um, it has had some challenges in, in so far as uh, the environmental impact uh, in review on, on whales as they migrate. Uh, one of the issues that I, I know is still under uh, review. Uh, but as we looked at that, and, and Provost Silva can talk to this as well, as we looked at that in the facility itself and the costs that we were encountering down there, and our desire, as I talked about earlier through SSU Bold and our, and our plan to consolidate the campus and where we would be making investments, uh, we decided most recently to shut that down understanding as well as that we could con continue to deliver uh, the marine biology programs right here on our campus. And, and I know um, uh, Gail Gasperich, Dean Gail Gasperich, who we're excited at her opportunity to become provost down at Millerville University in Pennsylvania. We're excited for her. And she's done a wonderful job making sure as we transition that we will have also the equipment necessary to continue delivering that program uh, up here on the main campus uh, in Meyer Hall. Uh, and I would ask Provost Silva if you want to add anything to that. But it, ultimately, it became a facilities issue uh, and a cost that we just, we don't own that pro uh, property uh, and we're not able to make the investment uh, for the number of students that it was pre presently serving. Provost Silva? Sure. Um, there are two things that I would allude to. Number one is uh, the distance was really a barrier to um, participation by a lot of students. We rarely had classes meet out there because for some of our students, getting there to those classes was um, a real hardship. Uh, so we have uh, reconfigured a, a few of those classes and they will begin to be delivered in Meyer Hall this fall. Uh, I, I never imagined that I would be invested in conversations around giant tanks to house, to house live specimens in an academic building, but here we are. Uh, the other thing that I would say to you is that when we um, turned the property back to the, Divi the Division of Marine Fisheries, we have already engaged them in a conversation about how our faculty and our students might be able to take advantage of the facility under their leadership and direction um, in ways that are meaningful. And we've already discussed the possibility, for example, of students doing internships uh, at the um, reassigned Cat Cove. So it will be a different relationship for us, uh, but I would also add there's no shortage of ocean nearby the Salem State campus. So um, I think we're in a good place. Thank you both. Um, next question, probably best suited for President Keenan. Can you talk about um, what the on-campus student experience may look like for the fall for those folks that are living in the campus housing, participating in athletics, et cetera? Sure, as I said, our, our goal is to return, Mike, as much as possible to normal. Um, Define normal is not necessarily the easiest thing to do, right? We're going to try to take some of the best of what we've learned from COVID. But, but ultimately, we expect, you know, occupancy in our residence halls to, to return. We expect, as the provost suggested, you know, our class uh, delivery, 70% uh, most likely modality uh, in seat or the traditional format with 30% online or hybrid or high flex or otherwise. Um, so, and, it's, and certainly for sports, we would expect uh, sports to return completely 100% uh, regular schedule and practice. Again, that's uh, every time I talk like this, I always have to put an asterisk on all of this is that it's all contingent on the assumption that another variant doesn't arrive, you know, come next fall and the, and the flu season comes around again. But again, assuming as we are proceeding right now and, you know, most of us here in the Commonwealth are, are vaccinated, uh, our campus is actually in fact participated in a vaccine site right here on our campus. Uh, we expect to be back to normal come fall. And I can't I can't wait for our students to return and, and our faculty and staff. Now, one slight alteration I, I will tell you, Mike, is that uh, we're not gonna be fully back on campus for the sort of uh, back office, if you will. And I don't, I don't mean back office in a negative way. I mean, not necessarily front facing with students. Uh, institutional advancement, for example, has uh, operated quite well uh, off, off campus. Uh, most of this year, as you heard Vice President Krauts, we've had a record year, in fact, uh, during COVID. So. Um, Karen House, Vice President House, 
uh, and Rita Colucci, who oversees human resources, are looking at ways that we can take the best of what we learned from COVID and provide flexibility and hopefully more work-life balance uh, for our staff here on campus. Uh, and so slowly in the fall, we will bring everybody back who needs to be on campus to support our students. And then hopefully uh, the second semester, the, the spring semester that we'll be able to adapt uh, moving spaces around in included. So um, again, looking forward, it'll be mostly, it will be a, a normal uh, arrival for students in the fall uh, and staff will be a little bit different or slightly hybrid, but we're, ex we're excited about it. Thank you, President Keenan. Um, this will be the, the last question we have before we kind of turn it over to President Keenan to, to close us out this afternoon. Um, and, and you just alluded to it a little bit in your, in your answer to the previous question, but for the group at large, um, what was the biggest lesson um, th this past year plus has taught us that, that we can apply um, as an institution going forward, you know, within your individual departments and your purview of the, the larger university community? Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to whoever would like to go first. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say a couple of comments, then I'll leave it to my colleagues. Um, you know, higher ed has not always had the recognition of being nimble, I guess I'll say. But as Provost Silva suggested, uh, the response that our entire campus had, both the faculty, the staff, the students, everybody was able to adapt uh, to this new way of, of, of living, of, of learning, of, of working. Um, and as we go forward, we're going to try to take the best of that uh, and continue to apply it. Because I, I do think there's certainly some challenges. But overall, I think for a lot of people on our campus, it provided more flexibility for our students, which always has to be our number one priority. Uh, but also, a, a, as I mentioned, a, a better work-life balance for many of our staff as well. Certainly those who had commutes or certainly those who had young children at home who had to deal with you know, their students not being at school and whatnot. Um, so we look forward to that and, and we'll implement as many um, additional policies that we can uh, to make um, life better for our staff here on campus. And, and I, and I you know, leave it to uh, the other, my colleagues here to, to uh, build upon that if they want. Sure. I'll, I'll chime in here. I will say for advancement, um, uh, technology and the adoption of it has expanded our ability to engage new people. Um, we just certainly don't um, anticipate seeing uh, all of our programming to be um, on this format going forward. We don't want it to be, um, but it did give us the opportunity to learn how it could be utilized to expand beyond the bounds of um, a drivable distance to campus and therefore include more uh, Vikings in the university life as a result. Um, so that's something I think we'll take away from this pandemic. Um, another thing I think we'll take away from this is that, you know, there is nothing that replaces an in-person conversation with um, someone who's passionate about the university. And I think I, I can speak on behalf of my team who are uh, extroverted uh, we look forward to having and returning to some of those conversations, um, being in person. But when being in person may be prohibited because of travel or whatnot, allowing for the flexibility of having interaction uh, via Zoom or to continue conversations that may not happen um, in the time frame that we think um, gives us greater flexibility. I think that you know to, to kind of build off of President Keenan uh, that word flexibility, and I think the compassion we found um, throughout our community and the care uh, that we had for one another, um, not only within our team and in advancement, but also within our alumni community. I think that um, is something we're gonna carry forward and something that's always gonna be a part of our DNA going uh, forevermore. Um, and I think it has been, but I think it was intensified because of the pandemic. Um, our care um, and for you, our graduates, uh, and your success. Um, so I guess I'll turn it over to my other colleagues to weigh in on how they see it. Jump in, I'll be really concise. Um, I've said that much like the class that entered in um, fall 2020, um, we'll be freshmen twice together. Um, is what I said to them because as a new member of the community, um, I don't have the context of, of what life was like um, before COVID. Um, but I will say that I feel that we all learned um, to check our assumptions, a little bit about checking our assumptions. Um, I'm in love with the way that we ask critical questions about the kinds of experiences that people are having in this moment because we realize to adapt to sort of this version of normal, the COVID version of normal, we had to ask questions about 
um, where students were, where members of our community were, what their needs were. And it's just been amazing the ways that, that everyone has risen to the occasion to be supportive and find ways to help people be successful. So I'll, I'll do two brief ones. Number one, faculty. Um, historically, there's been a fair amount of reluctance to engage in digital technologies in classrooms, certainly to move courses online. Uh, but as I alluded to in March of uh, 2020, we all had no choice. Um, nobody was happy. No one was prepared for it. No one was expecting it. We didn't expect a pandemic to show up halfway through the spring semester. But what I observed was that a lot of the notion that it can't be done was debunked. You can have effective relationships through these kinds of formats. You can teach in ways that are meaningful in formats other than lecture. And this is not at all to disparage traditional ways of, of delivering uh, academic content, but it was a real eye-opener to a lot of people. And some of the most uh, diehard um, opponents to the introduction of digital technologies into learning, um, they, their hearts and minds have been won over. And while they're gonna go back into the classroom this fall to teach in a, in a context that's more familiar to them, um, they are going to use our learning management system more effectively. They're going to use digital tools more effectively. They're more open to the idea of um, replacing textbooks, with what are called open educational resources um, that are all digital to no cost to the students. So that was a big part of it. What we said we probably couldn't do, we proved that we could. The other thing I would say is with students, um, I think we all had some level of misplaced expectations about how students would use online technologies for learning at the college level. So we all have this sort of, maybe this, we share this notion that this generation that we're seeing, they're digital natives. And so, you know, they would take naturally to learning online. That's a really bad assumption because this thing here where many of our students are and live is not a good tool for trying to take a course. So we really had to work with our students and to give them the support they needed to really be successful using our digital learning management system. And they were also getting used to this new way of, of doing things um, and new way of relating to their professors and to each other in the classroom. So. Uh, but we've we've taken a lot from that, and I think that come um, I know that come September of this year, uh, we will be in the most flexible and option based shape we've ever been. Thank you all very much. Um, love the idea of of meeting our our folks, no matter the constituency where they are, in an effort to best serve them, which seems to be the the overarching theme of of what we learned in the past year. So. Um, this does conclude the formal question and answer portion of the program. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today, and I'll turn the program back over to President Keenan to kind of wrap up for us this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you, Mike, for uh, pulling us all together. And, and thank you all at home so much for joining us today. Now that Alumni Weekend has begun, I hope you'll join us for tomorrow night's concert featuring Massachusetts' very own Blue Light Bandits. And Saturday features a full day of activities. And on Sunday morning, we will announce the 2021 Alumni Association Award recipients. Always one of my favorite times of the year. So thank you. I look forward to seeing you at other events this weekend and hope that you enjoy Alumni Weekend. And, and hopefully, as we said, next year, we'll have you back on campus and be able to see and speak with you in person and share some additional wonderful events that will be coming up. So go Vikings and enjoy the weekend. Thank you so much.